I'm very grateful to a lot of our presenters here, to Secretary Chu and Governor Granholm for their leadership in government, to all of our speakers for their vision. But I want to say a special word of thanks to our next speaker, because when my children were little, they were actually willing to change the channel from the mighty Morphin Power Rangers to Bill Nye the Science Guy. Bill Nye has a degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, according to his bio, he got on the path towards entertainment when he won a Steve Martin look-alike contest. Uh, he, uh, in addition to, he, his, the show won 18 Emmys, I believe, uh, in five years. Uh, and, and he is the holder of patents on a number of different products. You can explain these to us, Steve. Um, a magnifier that uses water, an abacus, I didn't, I thought the abacus was 3,000 years old, but there's an innovation in the abacus, which Bill Nye holds the patent for, uh, a device that shows people how to uh, learn to throw a baseball, and a toe shoe for ballerinas. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Nye the Science Guy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I was very excited about this talk. Un uh, until just a minute ago. Uh, <laughs> somebody said, is Bill Nye your real name? And I said, it's William Nye. And he said, well, why did you change it? <clears throat> I thought, well, we're in for it. So, greetings, ladies and gentlemen, greetings. I want you to, dare I say it, change the world. This is the Curiosity rover, uh, which is on Mars. Actually, it's a picture of the Curiosity rover. The rover is on Mars. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with it, it costs, depending how you reckon, uh, about $3 billion. Let me tell you something, it's not even locked. <laughs> it's just sitting there, anybody could just walk up to it. I don't know, just not planning. So, uh, let's say that this picture of the sun represents uh, the sun. Then uh, we will have if I'm going too fast, uh, we'll have the, uh, I, these things, sorry. We'll have uh, this uh, represent the Earth, the picture of the Earth. Now, if you ask an astronomer how far the Earth is from the sun, he or she will say it's one astronomical unit, or one AU. So it's very easy to remember. You go up to an astronomer and you say, AU. How far is the Earth from the sun? And then he or she, it is hoped, will say, AU. And that will be, you'll have agreement. It'll be fabulous. It's 100, 150 million kilometers, 93 million miles in the ancient primitive units from the 20th century. Uh, and so this turns out to be of great significance. If we go closer to the sun, to the planet Mercury, Mercury is, Mercury is 40% uh, as far, 0.4 AU. The planet Venus, is 0.7 AU, and you would expect Venus to be warmer, and indeed it is. Mars is about 1.5 AU on average, 1.5 times as far from the Sun as the Earth. And this makes a huge difference. Mars is cold, crazy cold. It's so cold. <sighs> okay, okay, no, I'm good, I'm good. Now, Bill's a nickname uh, for William. <clears throat> The ice caps on Mars have a little bit of water ice in them, but they're carbon dioxide. They're like frozen carbon dioxide, like you have at the birthday party or Halloween or in the background at Nye Labs. And so it's cold there. And it would be colder were it not for the Martian atmosphere. So this is the um, uh, Sojourner rover. Well, once again, a picture of the Sojourner rover which uh, this picture is from 1997, 1997. So it would be Tony Braxton, it would be Boys to Men, uh, Nirvana, no Nirvana, that was sort of three years earlier, their third album. Anyway, this rover is about as big as this table, but it had extraordinary instruments. On the surface of Mars, this rover was able to collect these data. The Martian atmosphere is extraordinarily thin by human standards. Or you might have to say, very thin, very thin, by human standards. It's 0.007 Earth's atmosphere. So it's less than 1% of the Earth's atmosphere. Seven 
seven, we used to say millibars. Millibar is a fine, happy, uh, uh, regular unit in metric system. But now, uh, with we've discovered that we try to have the system international. There's a 10 to the fifth in there. So now we say seven, uh, we say seven hectopascals. <laughs> hectopascals, what kind of unit, really? Millibar. So uh, I'm proposing that we change that to heps, seven heps, <laughs> be hep to be thin atmosphere of Mars. And so uh, with these seven heps, uh, Mars is able to retain a little bit of heat. And so there are places on the equator on Mars, if you're right here at noon on a summer day, it'll be about zero Celsius, right around freezing. About here it's 20 below. Here it's 40 below on Mars. Uh, it's somewhat different uh, from here. And so these data are compared to here along uh, this chart, which was published back in the day. And uh, we can see the composition of the atmospheres of these two planets, Mars and the Earth. And you'll just notice that the top line is carbon dioxide, and Martian, the Martian atmosphere is almost entirely carbon dioxide, 95% carbon dioxide. At that time, Tony Braxton, boys to men, uh, Puff Daddy, I believe, had his first hit in 1997. Uh, at that time, the Earth's atmosphere, rounded to one digit, was 0.03% carbon dioxide. Now, if you're scoring along with us, you exponent buffs, 0.03% is the same as 300 parts per million. 300 parts per million, it's the same number. But everybody in this room, I believe, maybe there's one or two exceptions, was alive when that number rounding to one digit, changed from 0.03% to 0.04%. Now, 1997 wasn't that long ago. It is the rate, it is the rate that we're pumping this stuff into the atmosphere that is changing the world. So now we're, you know, above 390 parts per million of carbon dioxide worldwide. Back then it was 330, 340, depending on how you reckon, worldwide. If we then, for comparison, comparative planetology, as my old professor Carl Sagan used to say, we'll go to Venus. It's 90 Earth atmospheres, 90,000 heps, 90,000 uh, millibars, and that crushing pressure has changed that world. The atmospheric drag acts like the tides on Earth. And the spacecraft just took this picture from the Russian space, well, in those days it was the Soviet Space Agency, uh, didn't last even an hour, it got cooked. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, know this, but it's hot enough to melt lead. If you went there with your fishing weights or your little toy soldiers, they would melt. And so I don't know if you have played this game recently, but I hope you all remember playing this game. You can't step on the floor because it's like lava, <laughs> and then you can't like drink the water out of the sink because that's, that's like acid, <laughs> and will like kill you. Well, let me tell you something, on Venus, it's really like that, okay? <laughs> they, if there are any of them, don't have regular rain. No, their rain is sulfuric acid. And wait, wait, there's more. The acid is, uh, the, the, the surface is so hot, how hot is it, the rain doesn't even hit the ground. It evaporates before it gets down. By reasonable reckoning, as people in Western culture, Venus is just like hell. We do not want to be Venus, bad. And the reason uh, this happened is the so-called runaway greenhouse effect. And the people who really got involved in climate change early on uh, were people studying the planet Venus. There is a deep lesson there. And so, uh, with this, we want to change uh, our world. This is uh, the International Space Station. Actually, uh, it's a picture of the International Space Station. It wouldn't, it, yeah, it wouldn't even fit in this room, to tell you the truth. So if you look at this picture at first, or pictures like this, I hope you get a little bit of the impression that maybe the Earth is out of focus. Like somebody was just getting the space station in focus and not bothering with the planet. But that out of focus if I may, is not 
anything but the Earth's atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere is extraordinarily thin. As the saying goes, the Earth's atmosphere is about as thick as a layer of varnish on a globe, a classroom globe. And so if you had an extraordinary car and some extraordinary uh, runway, and you could drive straight up, you'd be in outer space in an hour and a half. And that, my friends, is the problem. The atmosphere is extraordinarily thin. No matter who you are, anywhere in the world, and you have decided to stay alive, you breathe. Everybody, even my old boss, uh, breathed. No, I was never sure if he was one of us or if he was. Uh, so we want to address this problem, and this is the famous, famous graph. If you're not familiar with it, just cover it quickly. This is compiled nominally by Michael Mann, another guy who got interested in climate by studying the planet Venus. And this depicts the Earth's temperature over centuries. And this is the famous hockey stick graph. The Earth's temperature has been about the same for millennia, but in recent decades, in recent centuries, the Earth has gotten fast, uh, hot very fast. It's like the shaft of a hockey stick and then the blade of a hockey stick. And I tell everybody, it's not just that the Earth's getting warmer, it's the speed at which it's getting warmer. It's, that's what's getting us. That's what's gonna make it hard to react. And so this is where I want everybody in this room to help us, dare I say it, change the world. So here's the problem. I uh, went to the World's Fair in 1965, and if you're having trouble reckoning this, the album called Beatles 65 came out that year. <laughs> so Beatles 65, by the way, nobody bothered to put the 19 on it, because the 21st century was so remote. Oh my goodness, can't even think about it. Anyway, at that time, there were 192 or 193 million people in the U.S. And uh, my father and I were very disappointed. Now, my father, this is the guy, okay, you'll be shocked to learn. He's, uh, we're driving along and he's taking pictures of the odometer as to watch it change from 99,999 to 100,000. This is on Route 40 between here and Baltimore. I, I grew up in Washington, you guys, right on. I, uh, I went to Lafayette Elementary, went to Alice Steele Junior High. Okay, back when we had junior highs, middle school, yeah. And so uh, the cop pulls him over, what are you doing? I'm taking pictures of the odometer. <laughs> sir, really, uh, you know, really. It was, um, sorry, uh, it was with film. Uh, it was a, a camera, it was a way, the photons would come in and this uh, chemicals would react. But, uh, Sorry, so it was a way of storing photographic images without electricity, it was crazy. Anyway, uh, we had just missed this total board of the world's population changing from 2 billion, 999 million, 999,999 people in the world to 3 billion people. We just missed it changing. So now, if you go to the United States, and many of you have, uh, we have over 300 million people, and the world now has over 7 billion people. And it's those two things. It's the thinness of the Earth's atmosphere and the 7 billion people trying to make a living. That's what's getting us. That's why we have to change the world. And I submit that this planetary argument is unassailable. I mean, this is just the way it is. We have seven billion people. The atmosphere is thin. We don't want to be like Venus. This is uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. Actually, once again, a picture. Yeah, it really, I don't know. I don't think it would fit in here, to tell you the truth. And the Golden Gate Bridge uh, was the state of the art in the 20th century, in the 1930s. No one had ever seen anything quite this cool. And it's made of steel. And I can assure you, it is no myth. When they finish painting one end, they start again at the other end. They really do paint it constantly. It was uh, the coolest thing ever made. It was uh, enormous and beautiful. And steel. Well, I had the um, great privilege of meeting Rick Smalley. Uh, Rick Smalley, unlike most of us, Mr. Secretary, 
had a Nobel Prize, unlike most of us. I mean, sorry. And he, he, was, he was one of the guys who discovered what he called Buckminster Fullerenes. And Buckminster Fuller was an architect, very influential. He was the guy who promoted the use of geodesic domes. And so there's a, a, a model of this molecule in the foreground. So it's all carbon, it's nothing but carbon, but it's in a sphere. And uh, Rick Smalley told the story in just this, fan I mean, he was really he's a, st a great storyteller. He, he, would, um, he said he woke up at 3 in the morning and he realized the molecule that these astronomers are observing in deep space and couldn't figure out what it was, was not some carbon monoxide compound. It was actually just carbon in this shape that is extremely common. There's a lot of it in this room, but we had never realized it was there. So Rick Smalley's dream was to take the sphere of carbon and pull it apart in a soup of carbon and create these tubes. And these tubes would be 10,000 times stronger than steel. I'm sorry, Bill, what did you say? That's what I said. I said 10,000 times stronger than steel, and they would weigh a sixth as much. And we would explain to people like you, yes, back in 2013, our, our water pitchers were made of solid rock, and our, our cups were medium-length polyethylene carbon chains, <laughs> and we had to lift them with our arms. That's good. That's water. You know, now that I've tried it, I don't think I could live without it. Anyway, Rick Smalley was the first guy that I met that just said it, just said it so succinctly. The key to the future is not to do less. Now, I am so old, I'm so old, I went to the first Earth Day. I rode my bicycle from Northwest Washington to the Washington Monument. I locked my bicycle to a flagpole, which they let you do. Uh, let's say it was Michigan. Yes. I locked my bike there, and I, uh, I enjoyed the festivities of Earth Day. Now, in those days, everybody wanted you to do less. Okay, they want less, less, less. Drive less. Uh, uh, don't use as much clean water. You know, wear dirty clothes. Eat less. In fact, if you can, don't even eat at all. Just don't eat. <laughs> And that turned out to be just, it just didn't catch on. It, it's unpopular. <laughs> and so Rick Smalley was the guy that, for me, when I interviewed him, and I got to tell you guys, it was, it's really, um, it was really moving for me. I'm not kidding. He, he would speak for a few minutes, and then he'd have to sit down, and he'd speak for a few, and he'd have to rest, because he died of cancer just three months uh, after I interviewed him. But his message to the world was, we have to do more with less. More with less. That's the key to the future. That is how we are going to, dare I say it, change the world. Now, we don't have these carbon tubes yet. But if you told my father, who was quite scientifically literate, that you could have a signal from outer space and celebrate the International Farm Show 2012 by planting sunflowers in a soybean field to within less than seven centimeters, using global positioning signals, he would think you had lost your mind. And yet, these guys do it for kicks. This will be fun. And so this is a case where we can feed, this is how we are able to feed seven billion people around the world uh, and with the same amount of uh, resources, or in a sense, uh, with the same uh, efficacy that we did when we fed one and a half billion in my grandmother's time. When you go to Beijing, Every apartment building has a solar hot water system on the roof. Every building. And these people do not do this because they're a bunch of hippies trying to live off the grid. <laughs> they do it because the energy is free. The heat is free. The sun, it, it snows in Beijing. And when the sun comes down, it heats this stuff uh, in this heat pipe, this uh, refrigerant. It's a heat pipe, so it's a, a heatant. And the heatant boils up, gives up its energy to that scuba tanky thing, and then uh, it dribbles back down all day. This technology, by the way, like so many things in this room and on your person, 
is completely derived from the space program. Uh, the space program is this extraordinary investment. And I, as you may know, now have a day job, which, and Mr. Secretary, it really, this kind of thing cuts into your time. A day job, <laughs> just wow. Uh, <laughs> I'm the uh, CEO of the Planetary Society, and we promote space exploration, not just because it brings out the best in us, and we make discoveries that will change the course of human history, that's good. But it's also good for uh, the economy. So we could do this. I wish, I want somebody, some young person in this room to go into the solar energy business. You will get rich, okay? You'll be doing a good thing, but you're gonna get rich. You're gonna be like Bill Gates rich. You're gonna be like head of Ikea guy rich. You're gonna break in money like a, somebody who works at the Department of Energy. <laughs> okay, that was a bad example. That was a bad example. <laughs> No, the possibilities are huge. This, here, this is me, uh, I, no wait, I'm over here. There's a picture of me <laughs> on the roof of my house in Los Angeles. And I have four kilowatts of solar panels in the background. I would have more, but my neighbor's roof blocks some of my house, especially in the wintertime. So she travels quite a bit, so I'm thinking, You know, it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. All right, but I make way more electricity in the summer than I use. I sell electricity back to the city. Uh, then in the foreground is my solar hot water system, which I made up myself. It's a black plate with a zigzag of tubes, and the water gets hot, and then the water tank gets hot, and then I run that water through a tankless hot water heater to bring it all the way up to the temperature you need. Some days in June, July, you don't need to, the, hot, the uh, water heater doesn't come on and on, on at all, which of course is just so much fun. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, you got another thing. The solar hot water thing, it's plumbing. Okay, it's just plumbing. It is not rocket surgery, all right? You just, it just gets hot. It's, uh, we have these gas water heaters, it breaks my heart, man. Anyway, then also, in the foreground, I have a Sola tube, which is a brand name, and it has, um, a fr it has grooves in it, which are like a Fresnel lens, like, uh, like on these lights here. A uh, French guy, who, a mathematician, who showed that you could scoop out most of the uh, glass and have it still work pretty well. Anyway, it directs light down into the room below, and I still, I still go in there and try to turn out the lights. It's been, it's been five years, and I still go in, dude, dude. Uh, and so it's much more efficient than a conventional skylight. Even when the sun is low in the sky in the morning and the evening, it directs sunlight into the tube below. So then you don't have to turn on the lights. Whoa, brilliant. Now, this technology exists today. My solar panels, my electrical panels, are about 15% efficient. What if they were spacecraft style, 30% efficient? What if they were 50% efficient? Yes. What if they were 80% efficient? Ha 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 ha! We could change the world! And I want, I look, you guys, I grew up in the U.S. I was born in the U.S., or that's what they tell me. I don't know any better. I want the U.S. to lead the world in this. I mean, I'll just, I mean, if it's invented in Asia, I'm cool. And we all use it, cool. I'm all for it, bring it on. But don't we want to invent this in the U.S. and get rich in the U.S.? Come on. It'll be fun. I'm sure, sure. Thank you. Yes. Yes. But that's going to take investment. And here's the thing to the people in the front row. You have to learn algebra. It sucked for me. It's going to suck. You have to do it over and over. It's cool. Algebra, you can predict the future. I'm not kidding. So uh, we are also faced with a problem that's unique in the United States. Uh, well, Sorry, it's, it's very strong in the United States. We have people who insist on denying climate change. There's a, it's a whole industry of people who go around saying climate change is not happening. But I believe strongly, just listening to these people on the radio, reading their uh, blogs and stuff, I think, in general, the, the debate is no longer about science. They really, the thing for them is really not about science. And it's, it's really, I think, an opportunity for us. It's about personal freedom. That's what's really troubling the people who are denying climate change. 
So to the sociology people here and the psychology people, let's see if we can figure this out. How do we get across to people who are denying climate change right now that it's okay to accept the science and really we're all part of one community? We all live on one world. We all share the same atmosphere. We breathe it. We all share the air. If we can do that, my friends, we can change the world much more quickly than I think we'll be able to otherwise. So for the young people here especially, in the coming years, I am, I am pretty set, Mr. Secretary. Just I um, uh, am a mechanical engineer. Well, I mean, I'm human. <laughs> Uh, but a lot of times my pants don't reach the floor. Yes, I know. Uh, but uh, I took a lot of physics. Did you put it back? Yeah, no, I <laughs> took a lot of physics, and I'm pretty satisfied that we are probably not going to get there from here. We are not going to get there just by conserving, just by coming up with more efficient electricity technologies, uh, just by, going, uh, by doing more with less. And f I think, I'm pretty sure, we're going to have to do some extraordinary stuff. And uh, I may be wrong, bring it on, but it's susceptible to analysis, and uh, you guys can evaluate that in the coming years. But I just want to say, people are going to come to us with what seem like crazy ideas. They're, OK, I got it. We're going to plant reflective crops. No matter how hungry anybody is, we're not going to plant soybeans. We're going to plant crops that reflect light. OK, what are we going to eat? Well, we're working on that. All right. Uh, I got it. We're going to make artificial trees. And the artificial trees will take carbon dioxide out of the air. Well, why don't we use real trees? Well, that's brilliant. Oh, that's fantastic. OK. Then, uh, but it means negotiating with people who are cutting down trees and getting to keep trees, right? Uh, I got it. We're going to fertilize the ocean. Oh, cool. We're going to turn the whole ocean into a giant layer of pond scum. That's fantastic. No, I got it. We're going to, uh, we're going to make ships that make clouds. So you are going to somehow get enough energy to take water from the sea surface and put it high in the sky better than the sun does. OK. All right. No, we're going to, I got it. We're going to fly around and put particles in the sky that reflect sunlight into, into space, just, what happen, just like what happens when volcanoes erupt. See, that naturally cools off the air. That's great. So we're going to have acid rain all over the world. Fantastic. Or we're going to put reflectors in space. That's going to be great. They'll be very inexpensive, and nothing will ever go wrong. <laughs> all right, so people are going to come to you with crazy ideas, and people come to me with crazy ideas. Not that I'm any big deal. But there's one crazy idea that may be so crazy, it just might work. ha <laughs> ha. The wakes of these ships are white from bubbles. And these bubbles are macroscopic. They're as big as you can see. They're uh, baseball, ping pong ball sized. But when you get the bubbles especially small on micron scale, uh, thousandths of a millimeter scale, they, uh, they also reflect light, but you can hardly see them. They're, uh, when you have two samples of the water, you have to hold them right next to each other to tell one from the other. And you could, hypothetically, theoretically, control the bubbleness of the water very subtly. And you could lower the heat absorption of the oceans. Just, 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 just that much. And it may, it may work. Now, I will tell you, uh, the guy who came up with this it was a, an opponent of Carl Sagan. He and Carl Sagan used to go at it about nuclear winter. But the nuclear winter computer models that were generated in the 1980s, uh, 19, during the important work of uh, Sid Vicious and the Sex Pistols. <laughs> yes, the Deaf Leopard. Uh, the very important uh, time. Anyway. Uh, uh, these guys were at odds, but now they, he's kind of come around. It is an interesting thing. If this guy can come around, man, oh, man. So what you would have is somehow, well, the World Bubble Council would monitor the world bubbles, 
And ships, very large ships, would be required to carry some sort of bubbleator that would produce these bubbles in an economical fashion and reflect them into space. Or maybe that's too ambitious. Maybe you'd have ships drive along the ice sheet in, in the Arctic and keep the edge of the sheet from getting too hot, just by a little bit. Or maybe it's just cooling ponds at power plants. We produce bubbles behind Hoover Dam and quit having all that water evaporate at that extraordinary rate. Uh, so here's the idea. We have wind and solar making electricity. We put it in cars, like my Nissan Leaf. I go to the airport now, there's two, I can't get to charge because there's so many cars parked there. And we store it in there. Wait, wait, we store it also in this emerging technology of liquid metal batteries. Don't they get hot? Yes, that's the idea. The hotter they get, the better. It's a layer of magnesium, table salt, and some other salts, and antimony, or antimony, the one next to tin on the periodic table. The more energy you pump in, the hotter they get. And it still works. And then we ship this around the world on a smart grid, and then we run it through carbon nanotube power lines. As Rick Smalley said, it's as though the electron falls asleep at one end of the tube, has a dream, <laughs> and wakes up at the other end with almost no resistance. This technology doesn't exist, but the idea does. The physics does. We could, dare I say it, change the world. Now, this is a picture I hope everybody has seen. It's Saturn. It's a picture of Saturn. And uh, this is Cassini spacecraft several years. Cassino just took these cool pictures of the south pole of Saturn. But this one uh, is when it was on a big whew, out past Saturn. The sun is in the background. Light's coming up through the Saturnian rings. This glorious picture. Nature's halo. Extraordinary. And humans did this for just uh, the cup, price of a cup of coffee per taxpayer once over 10 or 12 years. But it's also, my friends, a picture of the Earth. The Earth is right there. And that's it. That's the whole Earth. If we go up into space that way, a couple hundred thousand kilometers, and look the same direction, that's it. That's the whole thing. No matter where you live on Earth, that's it. You're in the picture. <laughs> when I was in third grade at Lafayette Elementary School, Mrs. Cochran, my third grade teacher, told us there are more stars in the sky than grains of sand on the beach. And I remember thinking, well, I would probably didn't say this, but that's extraordinary. That's crazy. That's wild. I mean, I wouldn't have expressed it in this way. <laughs> um, Mrs. Cochran, are you high? Have you ever been to a beach? There is a lot of sand, lady. There's sand everywhere you look. Left and right, there's sand. Behind you, there's sand. Sand, sand, sand. The tide goes out, there's more sand. But there are apparently more stars than all of that. And so I began to think that I was nothing. I'm just like a grain of sand. I'm just this speck on the beach, like the other specks of sand. I'm a speck on the beach, on the Earth, which in the cosmic scheme of things is another speck. The sun, completely unremarkable star, nothing special about the sun. There are billions of them. I'm a speck on a speck, orbiting a speck with a bunch of other specks in the middle of specklessness. I am nothing. I suck. But then I realize with my brain, which is only this big, and in the case of my old boss, <laughs> must have been quite a bit smaller, but with your brain, you can imagine all of this. You can imagine the future. You can learn algebra. You can predict the future. You can, dare I say it, change the world. Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>